Headmaster uh, Kilgore, faculty, uh, graduating class of 2005, uh, parents, alumni, and friends. It's a delight to be with you tonight and to share with you on this uh, very important occasion. Several years ago, I was invited in Charlotte to uh, speak to the Mayflower Society. I felt it a great honor to uh, be talking to the descendants of the people who started this great country. And I noticed at the beginning of the meeting, they all stood and recited the Mayflower Compact. I was almost startled because in the Mayflower Compact, it says that the pilgrims came here, quote, for the advancement of the Christian faith in the name of King James, the defender of the faith. As happens to be the two purposes of Southern Evangelical Seminary, to defend the faith and to proclaim the gospel. So where they got off, we've gotten back on the boat and are training young men and women to uh, proclaim and defend the Christian faith. Uh, about 27 years after they landed, uh, the first school was started. It was started by a law called the Old Deluder Satan Law. That's right, the Old Deluder Satan Law. And they believed that Satan would delude people if they didn't teach their children how to read and teach them how to read especially the Bible. That began Christian education in America. Another century went by and our founding fathers on July 4th, 1776 said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I observed uh, that there were three basic principles stated in the Declaration of Independence about our country. One, it was built on a belief in the creator. Two, a belief that we were created, we didn't evolve. And three, that there were God-given moral absolutes. Uh, centuries went by. In fact, from 1830 to 1930, about 100 years, McGuffey's readers dominated our school system. Uh, one page in the reader says, God is the creator and his creation enables us to understand him in proportion as we investigate the secrets of the natural world, we're able to understand the nature of God. So our children were taught science so that they could know more about God, as well as taught the Bible, uh, moral law, and the Ten Commandments. In 1859, this all began to change. A man by the name of Charles Darwin wrote a book on the origin of species, followed by uh, his book, The Descent of Man, in 1871. Let me quote from the latter. Darwin said, to believe in continued intervention of creative power is to make my deity natural selection superfluous. His deity, he capitalized, natural selection, uh, replaced the belief in a creator. In fact, Darwin said, uh, there's absolutely no evidence that there was an omnipotent creator of this universe. His friend, Karl Marx, added, nowadays in our evolutionary conception of the universe, there's absolutely no room for a creator. Time sped on, 1934, a man by name of Adolf Hitler wrote a book, Mein Kampf, My Struggle. In it, he said, nature does not wish that a superior race should intermingle with an inferior one, because in such a case, all her efforts to establish an evolutionary higher stage of being may thus be rendered futile. One year later, the decent people of the state of Tennessee passed a law saying uh, that you cannot teach uh, the theory of evolution because it is godless and it is opposed to the teaching of the Bible. Uh, not well known was that in this textbook that John Scopes taught from is the statement that the Caucasians have evolved as the highest type of all races. Racism taught in the name of evolution. Creation, the Declaration of Independence that said all men are created equal is out and Darwin's natural selection is in. A few years later, 1933, 
group of evolutionists got together called Secular Humanist, and they set forth their credo. Quote, no religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. No creation. Two, humanism believes that man is a part of nature and that he has emerged as a result of a continuous process. No creation. Three, modern science makes unacceptable any supernatural or cosmic guarantee of human values. We affirm moral values derive their source from human experience. No God-given moral absolutes. That should ring a bell, a liberty bell. Because in 1776, our country was founded on three principles, creator, creation, and God-given moral absolutes. Now in 1933, a group of people are proclaiming their credo that there is no creator, no creation, and no God-given moral absolutes. The very next year, one of the most influential men in American history, John Dewey, 1934, wrote a book uh, called A Common Faith. Here's how he concludes the book. Here are all the arguments for religious faith of humanism. Such a faith has always been implicitly the common faith of mankind. It remains to make it explicit and militant. All we have to do now is to make this secular humanist faith that is diametrically opposed to the Declaration of Independence uh, the religion that's taught in the public schools. John Dunphy, a famous atheist, uh, wrote an article for which he received a, a reward in the Humanist Journal, which he said, I am convinced that the battle for humankind's future must be waged and won in the public school classroom by teachers who correctly perceive their role as the proselytizers of a new faith, a religion of humanity that recognizes and respects the spark of what theologians call divinity in every human being. He continues, these teachers must embody the same selfless dedication as the most rabid fundamentalist preachers, for they will be ministers of another sort, utilizing a classroom instead of a pulpit to convey humanist values in whatever subject they teach, regardless of the educational level, preschool, daycare, or large state university. Not only were secular humanists diametrically opposed to the Declaration of Independence, not only did John Dewey call it a religion and say, we have to make it the religion of the public schools, but we are forced to pay the missionary budget for the evangelists uh, of that system to evangelize our children uh, contrary to our faith and the faith of our founding fathers. It took a generation before their efforts paid off. Between 1934 and 1961, teachers were trained under this philosophy. They graduated lawyers who became judges, who became the Supreme Court of the United States under the liberal Warren Court. And in 1961, it began to pay off for the secular humanists because the court ruled that Secular humanism is an official religion protected by the Constitution of the United States. In 1962, they ruled that class prayer is banned from the public schools. We'd been praying for over 300 years before that. In 1963, they ruled that class devotional Bible reading was banned. We'd been reading the Bible for over 300 years. In 1980, they ruled that the Ten Commandments cannot even be posted on a bulletin board with a disclaimer uh, in a public school. And in 1987, the Supreme Court of the United States, following up on a trial that I was a witness uh, in Arkansas called Scopes II Trial, in which the judge ruled, indeed, creation of the world out of nothing is the ultimate religious statement because God is the only actor. And the court ruled that because creation implies a creator, that we cannot teach creation in the public schools. In the Edwards decision in 1987, it continues to say, concepts concerning God or a supreme being of some sort are manifestly religious. I sat there in the courtroom in Little Rock, Arkansas for nine days, uh, being the lead witness for the defense 
uh, defense of teaching creation alongside of evolution and uh, an advisor to the defense, I witnessed every tr uh, day of the trial, every witness, and I witnessed every day the U.S. Marshal come in and say, or should I say pray, as the court began, uh, God save the United States and this honorable court. And I witnessed that honorable court, or should I say dishonorable court, dishonorably dismiss the creator of the universe. Because on that day, December 7th, 1981, a day that will go down in infamy, infamy 40 days after Pearl Harbor, I witnessed the creator go to court and lose in Little Rock, Arkansas, in the buckle of the Bible Belt. That completed a 30-year period or so from 1961 uh, to 1987 in which the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that the Declaration of Independence is unconstitutional. That's right. Because the Declaration of Independence said our country is built on creator, creation, God-given moral absolutes, 1776. Humanist Manifesto, 1933, said no creator, no creation, no God-given moral absolutes, which became officially the law of the land when they ruled that you cannot teach creation, creator, or God-given absolutes in an American public school. Frederick Nietzsche, the famous atheist, uh, said, God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we, the murderers of all murders, comfort ourselves? Richard Bozarth, the head of the Atheist Society said, finally, it's irresistible. We must ask, how can we kill God, the God of Christianity? We need only ensure that our schools teach only secular knowledge. If we could achieve this, God would indeed be shortly due for a funeral service. Most people don't realize that God has already died in American culture. He died in the public schools. He's died in the public arena. And during that same period, from roughly 1960 to 1990, the words of uh, Dostoevsky, famous author of the brothers Karamazov, said, uh, if God is dead, anything is permissible. And during that same period of 1960 and 1990, teenage pregnancy shot up 200%, divorce 200%, teenage suicide 300%, violent crimes 500%, abortion 1,000%, and child abuse rose to an all-time high. Why? Because, as the two-line summary of the last two centuries puts it, in the 19th century, God died, and in the 20th century, man died. Because when you kill God, in whose image man is made, you kill man made in the image of God. When you kill the creator, you kill thereby the creature. When you get rid of the moral law giver, you have thereby abolished the moral law. Because to argue from the bottom up, if there is no design in nature, as evolution says there isn't, there is no designer of nature. And so we live now in the post-Christian world. We live where the recessional of Christianity is being played in the background. Uh, the church is God's tombstone, the preachers are his pallbearers, uh, and God is, for all practical purposes, dead in our culture. Now, what happened on December 7th, 1981, and the following decisions? What happened was an incredible decision that said that the Declaration of Independence is unconstitutional. If Thomas Jefferson were alive today, the man who said taxation without representation is tyranny, here's what he would find. He would find that he is forced to pay taxes to support public school teachers to teach his children that the Declaration of Independence is wrong. I have no doubt in my mind what Thomas Jefferson would do. He would start a second American Revolution. He would say the first revolution failed because there is actually more tyranny in the country today, less representation of our view uh, in a country where we must pay taxes to support those who are teaching contrary to our view than there was when they had the Boston Tea Party. In the Jefferson Memorial in 
Washington, D.C. A lot of people don't go across the river to see it. 